Richard Nixon was the most complex man I've ever known. Dwight Chapin writes this, saying he was an enigma wrapped in a cocoon of contradictions. He could take you around the entire world with his words, country by country, detailing the political dynamics, the shifting winds, and the power players in each place, while at the same time concerning himself with petty slights. He could be warm and gracious, cold and off-putting. He was a political genius, but he missed completely the dangers of Watergate. Dwight Chapin, on his memoir, 50 Years in the Making, The President's Man Now. My name is Todd Warner, and this is the Evangelization and Culture Podcast from Word on Fire. Dwight Chapin served as personal aide, special assistant, and then deputy assistant to President Richard Nixon, with responsibility for the planning and execution of the president's schedule and appearances. He served as acting chief of protocol for the president's 1972 historic trip to China. After his time in the White House, Chapin was publisher of Success Magazine, then managing director Asia for Hill and Knowlton Public Relations. For the past 25 years, he has managed his own consulting firm focused on communications and strategic planning. Dwight lives in Riverside, Connecticut with his wife, Terry. The President's Man is his first book. Dwight Chapin, welcome. Well, uh, hi, Todd. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this interview. Segment one, meet Dwight Chapin. I knew Richard Nixon well. Dwight Chapin opens his book, The President's Man. Dwight was an organizational field man in Nixon's 1962 California gubernatorial campaign, an advance man in the 1966 off-year election cycle, Nixon's personal aide in 1967, and by 1969, Dwight served as Nixon's special assistant and appointment secretary with a desk next to the Oval Office. By 1972, Dwight was in complete charge of logistical planning for Pre President Nixon's historic trip to China, Dwight Chapin at that time was 32 years old. So Dwight, the first question that just has to come to my mind when I look at this resume and all you achieve at the young and tender age of 32 was, are you lucky or are you good? I am lucky. <laughs> but my dad had a saying above his dresser. And the saying was, you make your own luck. Mm, yes, yes. So I would say I'm lucky but uh, by the grace of God, uh, I was taught early on how to create my own luck. And for me, that formula really was a lot of good hard work yep. and being loyal and be dedicated to whatever the job was that I was assigned. I grew up on a farm in Kansas and I had to feed the cattle at 430 in the morning mm. before I went to school. Uh, and at the time, I was like 13, 14 years old. And so I, I, I had been given responsibility. Li living creatures needed to be fed yep. before I went to school. Uh, so, you know, I, th this instilled in me by my parents, my grandparents, uh, by uh, my teachers and all that. I mean, it just all somehow came together and worked and taught me to have a sense of responsibility. So you could give me a job and you would be pretty assured that I would go out and, and to my best ability, you know, commensurate with my age and so forth, I, I would do the very best I could. And so um, I, 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 I give credit going back to my youth uh, and how I, how I was raised. Well, I want to I want to also say, as I asked that question, definitely tongue in cheek, you will find out in reading The President's Man how good I mean, D Dwight is the last person to be trumpeting his own horn. He's very self-effacing. He spreads credit all around. But let's be honest, you were very, very good at what you did. Uh, I want to step back. So so I pre appreciate you kind of kind of starting us off in your youth. I want to explore your background a little bit. One of the things you've said is that back in school, you struggled academically, but you had the gift for really making friends. And I want to ask you, how would you say that your warm and personal nature has helped you through your career? And And I want to piggyback off of that and say, to those students out there who struggle with the conventional measures of success, whether that's grades or testing and so on, but they have the unconventional gifts in abundance, like people skills, so to speak, what could you say to those people based on your experience about what those extra skills outside of the academic arena say about the promise of their future? You know, I, as a kid, uh, I remember being at times very, very unhappy 
and feeling feeling very different uh, than other kids. And I, I think that's really actually more the more I read and the older I get with having all these grandchildren we have, uh, uh, feeling inadequate or feeling different is not abnormal. Yeah. I mean, kids go through that. It's part of the growth process. My mine was really tied to the fact that I was I am incredibly dyslexic. And I I had never even heard that word dyslexic until I was in my uh 40s. Wow. And and I found out that I was and but yet I had back in my earlier days I I had somehow developed systems in order to get through school and so forth. Now, when I was in grade school, high school, I would get Fs, Ds, and I would be sometimes able to get a C. But it, even with those poor grades, I was able to make friends uh, within the class uh, structure, you know, the the uh, high school or whatever, and mm -hmm. and and use my personality, which yeah. uh, really compensated for my uh, deficiency on the reading side and the more academic side. I used my personality in order to make headway with, with, with the others in the school. And, and, and uh, the example, the best example of that is I, I became student body president. <laughs> uh, they, had to, they had to actually have a meeting of the administration as to whether or not they were going to allow me to speak at the graduation wow. because my grade point <clears throat> thing was so low. So, you know, I wasn't one of these stellar uh, type A type, you know, A's and B's type student. However, when I got to college, uh, first of all, my dad insisted that I go to a junior college and because he said I really needed to learn how to study. Uh, and it was an, a very smart thing on his part uh, because what happened is I finally achieved uh, a little bit of success. I can remember I, in junior college, I took geology, and I absolutely loved it. And the reason I did so well was that most of the information we were given was either demonstrated to us uh, or we went on field trips, mm. or the professor said it orally, and I didn't have to read a textbook. Oh. I, they had textbooks, but I but I got the information orally, yes. and that and I was therefore able to process it when the test came. Bang! All of a sudden, I've got an A. I wow. mean, it was like you know uh, the greatest thing that had ever happened, the greatest gift God had ever given me. Yeah. Uh, but but that that really gave me a lift, and I started started moving from something that I thought when I was younger, and that was I I always had this feeling underneath that I was not as smart as the other kids, the other kids that were getting A's and B's and so forth. They they were just much smarter than me, mm. uh, and I, I I really carried that. Uh, uh, kind of as a burden, if uh, to be honest, uh, but, and it was tied to getting those lower grades and so forth. But what, once I later on, once I understood this dyslexic thing, and uh, then it started to all come together and make sense. And and I I always love running into uh, uh, young people, or, or or maybe when I'm even giving a talk and mentioning some of this, somebody one of the young people will come up to me afterwards. And say, you know, I've been uh, uh, told that I'm dyslexic, and I, and I say, well, aren't you lucky? <laughs> uh, and they th they kind of look at me, and I say, there, there, because there's there's fame, there are stories about how dyslexic people, because they're wired differently, yeah. they think differently, and I do believe that during my lifetime, what one of the after I got out of the Washington. Uh, orbit and went on with my career. I I would I found that I was highly creative. I'm I'm not a good manager of people. I'm but I if you put me into a situation and say 
you want five or six different alternative ways to uh, engineer around a communications problem or something. I mean, to me, I can sit there and I can bat out these ideas one right after wow. the other. And I give credit to that, to the fact that I am so dyslexic. That's an incredible story. And it's so encouraging for those people out there who are listening, who either have gone through this experience or have children or grandchildren that are going through this, this experience. What a great way of looking at it. The other thing I think we all we have come to know, and there's a great book out there, out there called The Tyranny of Metrics. I think it's from Jerry Muller, if I'm not mistaken. But it talks about the notion that just because some things can be measured doesn't mean they're important. And just because other things can't be measured doesn't mean they're unimportant. And so all the you're talking about a lot of in tan, the, 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 many of the tangible metrics of success, you were kind of struggling with grades and so on. And yet so many of the intangible measures of success are the ones that were, are, were pivotal in your ultimate ability to do all you've done. I, I want to also make mention, I think it was when you were in China, which is an extraordinary chapter of your story. Um, you're in China and you're talking to Premier, is it Chao and Lai, who is second only to Mao, Chairman Mao, and he's dealing with you and he's over and over again when he encounters you, he's marveling that you are, I think, a 30-year-old man doing all of these things at the age of 30. Um, it just goes to show that notwithstanding some of the struggles you went through academically and maybe some self-doubt that you had, here you are not that many years later, not even having discovered, just working through your dy dyslexia without knowing you had it, right. sitting next to one of the most powerful people in one of the largest countries in the world, marveling not only at your abilities as a young man, but saying, we need to do this too in our own, in our own country, get our young people involved. Is that a fair assessment? That is, <clears throat> yes. But, uh, yes, it is a fair assessment. And uh, there, there was a man by the name of Herb Klein who was communications director in the Nixon White House. He was Nixon's press secretary when Nixon was vice president. Mm. And a few years after Nixon had left office, Herb made a trip over to China and happened to be, uh, have a meeting with Cho and Lai. And Cho and Lai, uh, according to Herb, I mean, obviously this, this is coming to me third hand, but Cho and Lai mentioned to him that one of the reasons that he had made a shift after uh, Nixon's historic trip what was that he saw so many of us that were young and he felt that in China they needed to shift gears a little mm. and and move the the age number down and, and get more young people and got all they were all old men I mean mm. what there, there were a few exceptions uh, my counterpart Han Su, uh, I was 30, 31. He met, probably was 52. and sure. he, But he was considered very young. Yeah. So they, they had uh, a, a different perspective when they, they met, you know, some of, some of us, the younger men. Uh, obviously, when, when you're young, when you're as young as I was, um, you know, I, I wasn't there in a policymaking role. Sure. Uh, and I'm sure that Cho, I mean, he was able to make that separate. He, he was so smart and so uh, with it in terms of everything uh, that, you know, that he, he put it into the right perspective. And it, was, it wasn't like they went out and got a bunch of 30-year-olds and started having them come up with, you know, strategic military policy right, or right, something. Right. But, but <clears> I think we, we did serve as an example as a, uh, 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 of how he could use more young people around him. Mm -hmm. Yes. It was uh, a defi that was a very defining thing. And and by the way, uh uh he mentioned that to the president. And then when I was working on the book, I found a very long handwritten letter uh from Mrs. Nixon to me say uh saying that when she, that this is I, I received it after I got home from China saying that uh, some of the Chinese leaders had mentioned my age to her. So I don't know who it was, wow. but uh, it had it, it, the, the reason for mentioning that to you is just to underscore the impact it did have. It's incredible, incredible. In 1962, Dwight, at the age of 22, uh, you were introduced to what you describe as, or who you describe as, quote, a perfectly groom, groomed, snappy, crew-cutted, California tanned, smiling man in his mid-30s, and this is none other than H.R. Bob 
Haldeman. Now, Haldeman, uh, to those who don't know, would become the future chief of staff for President Nixon. And in The President's Man, your book, you muse, quote, few people have the gift of being able to point to one moment and say, there, that's it. That's when my life changed for the better and forever. That was my moment, closed quote. Dwight, who was Bob Haldeman to you? Uh, Bob Haldeman was my uh, most important mentor, Uh, more important than Nixon, uh, more important than W. Clement Stone, who would come into my life a little later. Uh, Bob Haldeman was, uh, had gone to UCLA. I went to the University of Southern California, so it's hard to imagine that a UCLA guy would take <laughs> me under his wing, but he did. He overlooked and, it. Yes. Uh, he, I, I went down to the Wilshire headquarters. Uh, this was the Nixon for governor campaign because Nixon had lost to Jack Kennedy he had gone back out to California and order, and then he thought that in order to keep his political career active, he would have to be in the arena, and so therefore he would run for governor of California in 62, and Bob was his campaign manager. Mm. So uh, I didn't have a summer job, and this was 1960, summer of 1962, and my dad arranged for me to go in it because he knew I had an interest in politics, he arranged for this interview uh, through uh, a friend of his with the campaign manager, Bob Haldeman, and also uh, a fellow who was in charge of all of the field offices by the name of Herb Kambach. It was really at that point a combination of both Herb Kambach and Bob Haldeman. Mm. I went in, I first saw Herb. Herb and I really hit it off, and he said, I'll be right back. He went down the hall, came back, said, I, come with me, and I went down the hall, and that's the description that you gave. I walked in, here's this young uh, 30-ish crew-cut guy, Bob Haldeman, campaign manager, and he hired me right there on the spot. Wow. And then when we lost, and we lost big time, mm-hmm. uh, uh, that was in November. In December, I got a phone call from Herb Kambach, saying, Bob Haldeman wants to know uh, if you would be interested and come work for him at J. Walter Thompson. What's interesting about that is that Bob d- didn't call me directly. It's very <laughs> Nixonian. This is, exact, this is exactly how Nixon would do it. Nixon wouldn't put himself out on the limb and have some guy be turn him down. He would have somebody else go do the job and, and so forth. <laughs> so, so I said to her, I said, I'd love to go talk to Bob Haldeman. And I went over to J. Walter Thompson Advertising, uh, which was at the time really the pre- premier uh, advertising agency in the world. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they were the largest, the biggest. And Bob had been in the New York office, had come back and was running the Los Angeles office. And, and he hired me to come in. I'd go in after school. I was still going to USC. Uh, I would come in after school. And then once, once I graduated, I went to work full time. Uh, and and that's where this the depth of our relationship really got forged. He he really got to know me. I, you know, I'm a very young man at that time. I'm uh, 22 years old, uh, and he is basically teaching me his systems. And and as it turned out, he's teaching me the Nixon systems mm-hmm. for doing things. So I I got this early education in all of this from Bob. And then as everything unfolded in the, the months and the years ahead, uh, I had this, this working uh, friendship with him. It was, it was more than an employee-employer type thing. It was a, a, a very deep friendship uh, that carried right on into the White House. Let's talk about, um, th- this is a book, The President's Man, is a book rich with lessons, and I mean, you you really you really soaked up what your mentors taught you. I mean, you were a young man, and you could have just said, you know, I just got to get my job done. But but you clearly reflect upon the wisdom that that you lear- that you had from both Haldeman, Nixon, and others. <clears throat> could you say a few words now, just so people know, you moved from from uh, the, the advertising firm ultimately 
1968 or in the in the run up to the 1968 election, Lyndon Johnson's not going to run. Hubert Humphrey's going to run. Richard Nixon is going to throw his hat in the ring for the first time since the 62 gubernatorial campaign. And you're you're getting involved. And t- tell me briefly before we get into some of the lessons you learned from Haldeman. Uh, h- how did you ultimately get get drawn into the orbit at the White House uh, uh, with President Nixon and with with Haldeman? Yes. Uh, so I, I'm working for Bob Haldeman in Los Angeles, and ABC Television offered me a job uh, at a much higher salary than the advertising agency. Uh, I Bob said, "Let me you go talk to ABC, but let me have a conversation with you before you make a final decision." So I I talked to ABC about going over and going to work for them. Um, Then I went back to Haldeman. Haldeman said, I have a proposition for you. Mm. Don't go to ABC. You go to J. Walter Thompson in New York. We will send you to New York. That's the place to go to really learn the advertising business. Plus, you'll be on the East Coast there in New York where Mr. Nixon had moved, and you'll be able to make contact with them, and uh, if the campaign comes around in 1968, you'll be in a good position to be a part of that. Mm. So I, I, I mean, that was, that like was the selling ingredient right there. So I moved to New York, and, and here is the key point. When I got to New York, I contacted Rosemary Woods, who was Nixon's secretary, at the law firm where he was working down uh, downtown Manhattan. And I said, bros, I've moved back here, and I would like to volunteer to come in if you ever need anything, uh, any help. She said, well, I'll get back to you. So she called about a month later, and she said, would you like to come down and work on mail Mm. uh, and help us? We're getting all of this mail. Keep in mind, there's no email, there's no texting, there's no computer. I mean, none of this exists. None of the technology exists. This is old-fashioned mail coming in from, you know, the post office. <clears throat> so I went down there after work at J. Walter Thompson, New York. I would get on the subway and go down to the law firm that, where Nixon was, and I would go to this little conference room, and I would work on the mail. The person teaching me how to do the mail was Mrs. Nixon. And I think, <laughs> I think this is the, one of the key elements because she got to know uh, me, she would ask about, at that point, we had one little daughter, Kimberly, who was about two years old. And then Tracy came along about uh, six months later. And and <clears throat> Mrs. Nixon is getting to know me. And when you're working with people uh, that are uh, this prominent and, you know, in, in the public arena, uh, loyalty and trust yeah. and so forth is a huge issue. Right. And so whatever integrity I radiated, she picked up on. And I'm sure that one of the conversations uh, at, at their apartment one night must have been uh, when, when the president decided, or Mr. Nixon decided he was going to run for the presidency, was, you know, that young guy, Dwight, somebody yeah. you ought to look at uh, helping. Because, <clears throat> helping you, because... He, he needed somebody with him whenever he traveled. And that person, by the grace of God, ended up being me. Mm. Uh, and for two years, basically, almost two, two years, uh, it would just be the two of us. I mean, we would go out on all of these trips, uh, uh, whether it was a fundraiser or whether it was him giving a speech somewhere, whatever, wherever it was, I, I'm just like his shadow. Mm. I'm not... I'm not an advisor. I'm not a, uh, you know, a guru of any kind. But I'm, I'm there to take on any assignment. So that's kind of, that's kind of how it evolved that I ended up being part of his entourage. And then once he won, he he took the people to the White House that knew him and knew how how he wanted to operate. And uh, I was part of that cluster. I was I was I was in the bubble. And that, therefore, I was able to move on in. But I, get, I, oh, please. I, I, well, I just uh, let me. I, I, w- I was going to go back to one of your points sure. uh, of lessons. 
and one of the lessons here is, you know, I had a good job at the at the advertising agency. They were training me to be an account representative. Uh, I was going downtown and helping with the mail, and I was doing menial type work. Mm. And the lesson in there is, you know, don't don't get on your high horse and say, I am I'm not I you know I I don't want to do the mail. You know, I mean. Other people can do that better than me or whatever. You, in, in, when you're in, a, in the political arena, you do whatever job it is they give you to do, whether it's running the Xerox or being a messenger service and taking something across town, whatever it is, you, once you get in the door, you just do what people are asking you to do. And by the way, by the way, you might be doing you might you might be doing mail with Mrs. Nixon. <laughs> I mean, I mean to your well, point, and to your, I mean that was fortuitous. But to your point, and I think this again is your genius of drawing from the gifts that you really knew you had, and and the work ethic you had. You know, the guy milking cows at four thirty in the morning when you're a teenager, and so on. You, there's work to be done. You do it. And by the way, in the modern era nowadays. That stands out. I mean, it stood out then, but it really stands out now because the work ethic and the integrity is really kind of on a shaky ground right now. Yes, I, well, I, I, I believe uh, I, this sounds very old-fashioned, but I, I mean, uh, we do pamper kids now. I mean, we, we, we don't demand of them what they could be doing at earlier ages. Uh, and, uh, so I think it's incumbent upon parents to, uh, get the message across to, to the kids that the, the issue that we're dealing with is that a, a lot of parents, uh, people raising children didn't go through this kind of discipline themselves. So they, they are not really uh, aware of what I'm talking about. Once, once they hear it, you can, I can see it in an audience. I'm there giving a talk. I'm showing some slides. Uh, I show a sl slide of being on my horse, you know, on back on the farm or something, and and feeding the cattle in early hours. And you can just see people kind of going, "Wow," you know. And then I'm, I, I might get a question about it or something. But the, but it's kind of like a wow. I did, you know, that's that's really something. <laughs> it's like. You know, me, me hearing about somebody driving a uh, covered wagon across America yeah, yeah, or something. Yeah. You know, how did these people ever do that? <laughs> you know, how did you ever get up at 430 to feed cattle? I can't even get my teenager out of bed at 830 to go to school, you know? Yes, yes. Just, I want to ask you, so so Richard Nixon in 1968 is elected president. Haldeman ends up serving as chief of staff. You're recruited to serve as special assistant, then deputy assistant to the president's answerable to Nixon and Haldeman. I want you to say a word or two about Haldeman as a demanding master. We're talking about, as you're describing, you know, the need the, the need for discipline, the need for high expectations. And Haldeman was, could be tough on you. I want to ask you about Haldeman as that demanding master, that demanding boss. And secondly, what are some of the, the, the enduring lessons you learned from Bob Haldeman and his method? This is a complicated question, and yeah. it's a it was a complicated relationship. It was a uh, a very a warm relationship, very friendly. But as we got further and further up the ladder, uh, into uh, moving from just being in the agency in Los Angeles to entering in, into the White House. <clears throat> It was a uh, it, he 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 by necessity had became tougher and tougher and more and more demanding. I am trying to deliver at the right level, uh, but keep in mind I remind you that written memos and things like I was very dyslexic. Mm -hmm. it, when when they moved me later, and I'll, I'll come back and touch on it into more of a public relations idea game what we called game planning uh area of responsibility i mean i, I just went off the charts and mm -hmm. that that included the china trip and all over range but i mean i that's i just took off like a racehorse uh but but when i was back into the more uh demanding detail type work 
I was really struggling under Bob's uh, tutorship because because of that dyslexic thing. And he was Mensa. He yeah. he is a member mm. of Mensa. This is he is probably one of the great managers of all times. Right. Uh, I, I was talking uh, the other day to uh, uh, Christopher Whipple, who has written a book on the gatekeepers on the chiefs of staff. Mm. And, and we were chatting, and he, and he had talked to six chiefs of staff. Uh, I beat him because I talked to seven of them, <laughs> including James, Jane Baker, Dick Cheney, Don Rumsfeld, Ken Diverstein, all, all these guys. I've known all of these chiefs of staff. Right. And they all praise what Haldeman put in place in order to manage the office of the presidency. And it was a staffing system by which he ran uh, ran the, the West Wing and the president's daily uh, activities and so forth. And, and that he set up a model that continues to this day. And, and so I was a cog or whatever you want to, a spoke in that wheel of, of a, 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 along with many other staff at the White House that operated under these Haldeman principles and under the way that he and the president wanted things done. So <clears throat> my, my ability to deliver increased uh, and my responsibilities expanded as I got out of much of that detail type work over time and was allowed more freedom mm. to go out and to do uh, the game planning and the public relations that I'm talking about. So, you know, when you say what was Haldeman's standards, uh, it, I, I think that the, the real denominator was would be uh, one word, presidential. Mm. Uh, we work for the president of the United States. That basically means there is no tolerance for error. Wow. We, we have to be right in what we do. We have to make sure that we do everything to the very best of our abilities and at a what he would call a presidential level. Yeah. Uh, and he demanded that. He was respected for that among the White House staff. Uh, he was viewed as being incredibly tough, uh, very uh, demanding in, in, in his uh, management style. Uh, he said later in life, that he wished he had been a little less demanding, that it probably that he probably had gone overboard. But <clears throat> keep in mind that uh, when all this is happening and, and we're, we're thrown into he, n not just me, but Bob Bob Haldeman himself had never been in the White House until he went in with Nixon. And, you know, I mean, this is a whole new thing, mm. and so his his tendency to to be overly demanding to me is perfectly understandable. It's it's this book and, and what you're saying right now, the book is so good in terms of highlighting the pressures. He was under the pressure. You were under the standards, um, the constant revising of how do we make the president's time more efficient? How do we, how do we get um, him in front of people? How do we get the message out? But how do we also afford President Nixon thinking time for some of the major policy decisions and so on? And like you said, I read the ends of power from the the Haldeman memoir a year or two ago. <clears throat> I remember him saying, gosh, you know, I wish I would. Uh, maybe I went a little bit too far in terms of the standards I had. But they were presidential standards, as you just mentioned. That's fascinating. Todd, on the, the uh, time is a very interesting subject. I mean, I was in charge of the president's schedule for the whole time I was in the White House. Mm. And I reported to both uh, uh, Bob Haldeman and the president on the president's schedule. And <clears throat> the thing that's so interesting to me is the person most interested in the schedule and play, working at, and trying different things was the president himself. Mm. He, he, he was obsessed with, you know, the use of his time. And he... 
Uh, a, a good example would may be the, the 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 required meetings, you know, where you're giving the plaque for the teacher of the year or the city of the you know the city of the year or uh, at Thanksgiving time, you know, you have to give a pardon to a turkey. I mean, you know, all all this kind of stuff that's required of a president that he's saying, you know, I've got uh, there's a war going on in Vietnam yep. and you're expecting me to be doing all of this kinds of stuff. And so there there's this that he creates this idea of thinking time. He says, I I need time to be here to think. And yep. and we that's comes that uh, the, the, how that all came about is in my book, as you know, but but it was the president himself more so than Haldeman, that was working the time side of things. Incredible. Segment two, witness to history. Immediately after winning the presidency, Richard Nixon and a limited staff, including Dwight Chapin, proceeded to Walter Reed Medical Center to visit the gravely ill President Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower, Chapin wrote, had made Richard Nixon's presidency possible. I thought that visiting Eisenhower on Nixon's first day as president-elect was a beautiful gesture and a sign of great respect. So, Dwight, I want to ask you about not only being a witness to history, but a participant in history. Let's start with what are some of your proudest accomplishments while working in the White House? Can I tell you a story before please. I do that? Yeah, please. Um, because I love telling this story. Uh, in 1967, so the election is in 1968. But in 1967, uh, I, got, I got the phone call from Mr. Nixon. He says, Dwight, tomorrow uh, we're going to leave early. We're going to fly down to Washington. Uh, I'm going to go over and see. I, we're going to go see the general. Hmm. Well, he met Eisenhower. <laughs> so, so the next morning we flew to Washington, D.C. from New York. And uh, we were met by a, a, an old uh, Secret Service agent that had been with Nixon when he was uh, – Vice President by the name of Dale Grubb, and Dale had, took his personal he had his personal car, and we the three of us get in this car and we drive to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and that is where the there's a little college there, Gettysburg College, and on the grounds is a a, a white building that uh, where General Eisenhower had his office. Uh, after he left the presidency, he moved to Gettysburg, and so he had this area where he worked, and there was a, a, a kind of a sloping lawn and a, a walkway down the lawn. And uh, so Mr. Nixon went in to meet with the general, and I went to lunch with uh, one of the general's uh, speechwriters uh, that had come from the White House to Gettysburg with him. <clears throat> and we finished lunch, and we're back over, and I'm standing with uh, Dale Grubb down by the automobile, that, and we're waiting for Nixon to come back out. And sure enough, the door opens, and out comes uh, Mr. Nixon with uh, President Eisenhower, General Eisenhower. And they're, they're walking down this walkway, and Mr. Nixon uh, summons me over. You know, he kind of gives a motion, come over here. So I go over, and uh, he said, General, he said, I want you to meet another Dwight. <laughs> and, and so he wanted to know all about my name, Dwight, and, and where I'd come from. And he, he was from Abilene, Kansas, mm -hmm. and I'm from Wichita, Kansas. So that also led to part of the discussion. But the, I remember, best of all, I couldn't wait to get home and call my <laughs> grandparents and my parents. I mean, meeting General Eisenhower is uh, one of the biggest th thrills I, I had. So I, I got a little off track there, but uh, I, but, I wanted but, to tell but, that story. But but uh, that's that's uh, that's going to be that was going to be one of my next questions was to me, and we'll come back to your proudest accomplishments. The notion for you to be a uh, to be in the presence, of course, with President Nixon, and it's just got to be you're you're awestruck with 
the, the, the personalities and the powers and so on. But here you are with not only President Eisenhower, but the supreme allied commander of World War II. And there you are exchanging pleasantries about your name and your Wichita uh, origins and so on. I mean, I mean, y- y- there must have been innumerable occasions. Um, I know where you're, you're seeing pre- pre- Charles de Gaulle across the hallway or, or, or in, in the room you're in or, 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 or Cho and Lai or President Lyndon Johnson, Frank Sinatra. And it's not that it's just about, you know, just rubbing elbows with the, with the high and the powerful. But I imagine as a young man who earned his way to where you are with a little bit of luck, but a lot of hard work, I imagine there were plenty of times when you're just pinching yourself saying, can you believe this? You get home to your wife, you call your parents. What, is that fair to say? Yeah, it's surreal. It, it was just surreal. I mean, it was uh, not to be believed. I, what, one of the, the same things when you were saying it, talking about that, I remember hearing, uh, I was at my desk. And somebody said, Thomas, Tom Dewey is downstairs. <laughs> Dewey, Dewey had run against Harry Truman. In fact, the headline, the, you know, the classic headline is Dewey wins. And yeah, uh, yeah. De- Dewey didn't win. But yeah. he was always a hero to me as a young kid growing up and so forth. Uh, Thomas Dewey, for some reason, I mean, I got up from my desk in the <laughs> West Wing. I went downstairs as fast as I could to introduce myself, you know, to meet Tom Dewey. So wow. uh, he he wasn't the most famous one that I I met, but he, t- for me, uh, he, he it was quite a, a thrill. The uh, you mentioned the Charles de Gaulle uh, funeral in Paris. There was this uh, reception after the funeral, and I went in there with. Uh, Mr. Nixon, uh, President Nixon, and so I, I, you know, I kind of stood to the side. But Haile Selassie of Ethiopia would walk by, and then mm. here would come Prince Charles, and then Queen Elizabeth, and oh. then I mean, it was like it was like being on the back set, you know, of where they were making a movie or wow. something. And and I can remember, I thought, I, this is just this is just unbelievable. Brezhnev is standing over there. I mean. Unbelievable! I was so for so lucky. Uh, I I pinched myself often uh, because there was this bo- very wise man who had worked for General Eisenhower and then was in charge of congressional relations for Richard Nixon. His name was Bryce Harlow, an older older guy. Uh, and, and Bryce Harlow and Pat Moynihan. Pat Moynihan had been in the Kennedy administration and was going to be part of the Nixon White House. And both and Moynihan and Harlow put on a seminar for us at the Pierre Hotel during the transition years, mm-hmm. uh, during that year after, after the election was in no, November. So we all of December and the first part of January were doing the transition at this Pierre Hotel. And they had this uh, kind of a uh, awareness type morning where they were explaining to us what we were going to be account- encountering when we went into the White House. And I, I, I remember, and I, I never forgot, I never forgot this. Bryce Harlow got up there and he said, folks, let me tell you, don't ever, ever forget what a privilege it is for you to go to the White House and how temporary it is. Mm. You are going, you, you, this is a public trust yeah. situation and you are lucky and it is temporary. He must have said that five times, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. And I, I always kind of kept that in the back. I never, I never assumed that you know, this was something where, you know, by the divine gift, you know, mm-hmm. I was now anointed, you know, and the White House was forever. Uh, I, I believe I understood that I was, it goes back to your opening, opening remark, that I was very lucky. You very know, it's lucky. amazing. <clears throat> what comes through in this book and this interview, obviously, was the deep sense of wonder you never lost, uh, you, that, 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 that it was, it was, something that even in the midst of the stresses and the strains and so on, you never lost that sense that what a privilege, what an honor, what what an incredible degree of wonder I'm experiencing just just being here 
um, again, a witness as well as a participant uh, uh, in history. I want you to blow your own horn here a little bit, though. Can you say can you say a word or two about what your proudest? I mean, I, I can guess in my mind as for reading your your book. What what is among your what are among your proudest accomplishments in the work that you did in the White House? Well, my, the China trip would be my uh, number one, my number one thing. Um, but in listening to you and think, thinking about it just in this moment, I think maybe my greatest accomplishment at the White House was not China. Mm. I think maybe it was the relationships I built. Mm. To this day, I'm a great friend of Henry Kissinger's. Uh, he's in touch. Uh, you know, his new book came out just, uh, well, actually it was a year ago, September. It's time flies very quickly. Mm. But his inscription was phenomenal and beautiful. And uh, uh, it was an honor to receive it. But I, I have, I have across the board with, I believe, everybody that's that I served with. Uh, I had a, there was an esprit de corps uh, among us, and I, I believe that my, uh, my attitude, and the way that I treated people. Mm -hmm. uh, helped me build these relationships. Uh, so, uh, and, and I also would add uh, contrast. Mm. My boss was Bob Haldeman, and he was tough, perceived as mean, and I was perceived as kind of the nice guy and the person that everybody could get along with. So uh, I think I gained uh, by the uh, misrepresentation, and if you will, of, of who Bob really was. Hi, I'm Todd Warner, Managing Editor of Evangelization and Culture, the journal of the Word on Fire Institute. Word on Fire is a global evangelical community that exists to provide our members with the resources they need to proclaim Christ to a secular culture. Our award-winning quarterly journal, Evangelization and Culture, is offered exclusively to Word on Fire Institute members. It's a tangible representation of our mission and goal to lead with beauty in order to bring others to the knowledge of truth. Inside each issue, you'll find writing from premier scholars and inspiring pieces on literature, culture, and daily life from fellow missionaries on the journey to know and serve Christ. Get a copy of the current issue of the Evangelization and Culture Journal for free by visiting wordonfire.org slash journal. Thank you, and join us in bringing Christ to a hungry culture. Segment three, lessons from Richard Nixon. In The President's Man, Dwight Chapin tells this story. A young man told his wise grandfather he was confused about the battle between good and evil. His grandfather nodded in understanding. There are two wolves battling inside me, he explained. One is evil. He is anger, hatred, vengeance, resentment, inferiority, bitterness, revenge, misguided pride, envy, and ego. The other is good. He is peace, love, hope, decency, optimism, generosity, compassion, empathy, humility, and kindness. That same fight is going on inside all of us, including you. The young man considered that silently and then finally asked, which one wins? His grandfather looked at him and said softly, the one you feed. So Dwight, who in your eyes was Richard Nixon? Well, I'm coming to this from a very prejudiced point of view. Mm -hmm. But uh, I believe that history will will sort it out, and that mine's not as prejudiced as maybe it is objective. Yes, yes, Nixon had his warts. There's no question about that. Uh, but I would say we we all do, as as that little narrative. Uh, detailed. 
But Nixon was a very good man. Mm. Um, you know, he, he didn't have to take his finger and say, Dwight, come up here. I want to interview, oh, introduce you to General yeah. Eisenhower. He didn't have to do that. I saw him do things like that hundreds of times. I, 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 saw, I, I witnessed him as president of the United States where somebody would, I would bring in from in the Roosevelt room for whatever appointment that they had with him, and they would be shaking like a leaf. Mm. And he would pick up on that instantly mm. before they even opened their mouth. And he would start talking. And he would go on, and he might talk for four or five minutes. Well, the whole idea being to get that person to relax and to not be fearful of the situation that they were in. These are little things, yeah. but they matter. Yeah. I, I had one of the most poignant hap things that happened, and it was like the fifth or sixth day we were in the White House, and the buzzer goes off, and I, I, my, my office abutted right up next to the Oval Office, there's a side door that's built into the wall of the Oval Office. The door actually curves uh, as the office curves. And when the buzzer went off, I went flying in because that meant that he wanted me in there. Uh, and he was standing in front of his desk. So he wasn't, he wasn't seated behind. He was in front of the desk. And he was holding in his fingers, hand, he was holding... Uh, some pale green uh, letters. Now, pale, uh, it's a very pale green stationery that the only person in the world that uses that stationery is the President of the United States. It has a gold presidential seal at the very top of the letterhead, and he's holding these letters, and there's tears coming down the side of his face. Mm -hmm. You know, and he's, he says here, he says, give, please give these to Rose. Uh, so he, that Rose Woods being his personal secretary. Mm. And I took these letters and walked out and looked at them, obviously. What was I giving Rose? And these were letters to parents who had lost sons in Vietnam. Uh Nixon was a Quaker. He didn't believe in war. He abhorred war. Uh, he believed in a concept called peace at the center, mm. where where one how one centers oneself, and you know there may be chaos all around you, but how you keep your equilibrium. There, there, so there, there's all this stuff about Richard Nixon. So, mm. so when you say which, which, what. Did he was the the bad side of Richard Nixon being fed, or the good side of Richard Nixon being fed? To me, he he was a very good man. Uh, controversial, no question about it. Having to deal with a war that he didn't even start when he came in there, there were five hundred and ten thousand troops in Vietnam. He didn't put them there. He inherited that mess. And he wanted to end the war. And when he left office, uh, the the Paris Peace, Peace Accords were about ready to be signed. And he, he I think it was down to 5,000 men at that point. Still too many in his opinion. Mm -hmm. He wanted it over. Yeah. Uh, but there are those people that believe that Richard Nixon kept the war, and, and Henry Kissinger kept the war going so that he would have a victory in 1972 that that one really frosts me i mean yeah. that that is just so so <clears throat> unfair i mean on that tombstone out in california at the nixon, richard nixon library where both richard nixon and mrs nixon are buried on his tombstone it says peacemaker and that's how he wanted to be known that's how he wanted to be known if you wanted to feed which side of Richard Nixon, it would be the, the peace side, not the war side, the, the, the compassion side. He had incredible compassion for people. 
this is, you know, it, this is the guy that got up at 4.30 in the morning. He didn't feed cattle. He, he, he went in to Los Angeles and got the produce for his father Frank's grocery store and got it back out to your Belinda, and then he went off to school. This is a guy that had a, uh, uh, <laughs> they, they joked in, uh, at Duke, they called him Iron Butt because he, he sat and studied so much. Uh, I mean, this is a guy that worked his tail off, uh, you know, to, to get ahead academically. Uh, so anyway, I, I'm rambling, but no, no. The, the, to me, uh, the, the good side of Richard Nixon prevailed. Obviously, uh, he had some resentments and uh, obviously he made some huge mistakes that led to his, to the resignation, but the mistakes on res for resignation are more about judgments of people mm -hmm. than they are about him doing anything illegal. You know, you're leading this into this question. I want to ask you this popular impression of Richard Nixon of this dark, scowling, paranoid and corrupt politician. That's not that's I mean, with your having the vantage point you had next to him, not only not only in the Oval Office, but also the years of working with him in the in the run up to his election to the presidency in 1968 you really unfold so much of who he was as a person, but also as a politician. And you don't spare him where he doesn't deserve to be spared. But what's interesting is when I'm reading your book, I'm scrawling time and time again, RN, Richard Nixon lesson, in the margins of the pages of your book, um, from paying attention to the little things in people's lives, from courting future leaders in, in um, adversary countries like China or the Soviet Union, um, optimizing the impact of events through messaging and technology to being a sensitive and loving father. I think you've mentioned how easily he was moved to tears. You know, many, many people may not know that, but, but you've said he was easily moved to tears. Um, now we all know, as, as you've described, notwithstanding his personal demons, he, he seemed to be a savvy politician and a deeply human being more than many know. So, um, you've, you've kind of unfolded so well in your book and also in our conversation here. Are there any other enduring lessons you learned from Richard Nixon, the politician or Richard Nixon, the man that you could share with us? Well, I, th I believe that one of the great lessons, uh, for any of us to learn from Richard Nixon, uh, is that life goes on and he had this uh, this this ability to to rise back up again uh, most men and women would be defeated by some of the stuff that he went through I mean Jack Kennedy beat him and you know, then he tries for the governorship, he loses, he goes back, he spends what they call the wilderness years mm. between 62 and 68, decides he's going to go again, he runs, he wins, uh, he then suffers the greatest humiliation that any president could ever have and and resigns after because of Watergate. He goes to California and he almost dies. He had plebitis, uh, and he and he almost died. Then he then he goes to work on his memoirs, and he starts resurrecting his his career. Uh, it's going to be different. He's going to be an author, basically. He wrote nine books mm. after he left the presidency. He consulted with other presidents. Uh, he, Bill Clinton talks about uh, one of Nixon's last trips before he passed away was to Russia. And Bill Clinton talks about that uh, a memorandum that President Nixon wrote to President Clinton upon his return from Moscow and the advice and guidance that was mm -hmm. in that letter. In fact, Bill Clinton mentioned that in his eulogy uh, 
out in Yorba Linda at Nixon's funeral. So this, the resiliency in this man, the, the ability to come back and still be making a contribution of, of service to the nation. I mean, he was one of our great uh, public servants for decades, decades. He gave of it, of himself. He could have he could he could have been in New York making millions of dollars, mm. millions, and he, that's not what he wanted to do. He wanted to be in the arena. He wanted to be, con, contribute. He he loved foreign policy. He understood it. He knew the leaders all around the world. He even continued to do that after uh, after he, he, he had resigned the presidency. He continued to travel and meet with world leaders. And it's kind of interesting in today's world, What I, I was reminded of this last week because one of my good friends, uh, uh, Colonel Jack Brennan, who was one of Nixon's aides, passed away last week. And and I was l reading the uh, part of his obituary, and he had gone with Nixon down to Mexico when the Shah of Iran was refused entry into the United States when he had cancer and was dying. <clears throat> and the Shah was down in Mexico, and Nixon flew down there to be spend some time with the Shah, that 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 shows the extent of his loyalties. Keep in mind, the Shah had to go there after the Mullahs took over, and you know, uh, at the end of the Carter years, right when yeah. Reagan was coming in in 1980, uh, that that that's when this period was happening. Um, so, my 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 greatest lesson from Richard Nixon would be. And, and I think it applies to anybody that goes through hardship, gets defeated, loses a loved one. I mean, it is <clears throat> come back, make another contribution, figure out how to live. Life is going on. You're there for other people, for other causes. So that's a power of example. Segment four, <clears throat> Watergate and lessons about human nature. In The President's Man, Dwight Chapin wrote, quote, A scandal like Watergate was a new thing. It had been many, many years since we'd seen any significant Washington scandal of Watergate's magnitude, so it was exotic as well as exciting. Today's scandals have become commonplace, and the public has become more inured. Ordinary scandals today involve things that make Watergate at its worst pale in comparison. So the whole genre of modern politics, the present-day scandal culture, was being born on our backs, my back, close quote. Um, Dwight, <clears throat> to set people up to understand how you became entangled in the Watergate narrative, could you tell us a little bit about a man named Dick Tuck and then a conversation you had with President Nixon and Bob Haldeman about finding anybody who could do Dick Tuck type stuff? Okay, Dick Tuck was a character. I mean, a real character. I knew, I knew him. I think I first met him in 1962, and he was famous for going out and pulling kind of pranks or prankster-type uh, events on uh, Republican candidates. He was a Democrat. He was part of the Kennedy organization when Jack Kennedy ran in 60. Um, what would be an example of a Dick Tuck-type thing? Well, one example is that Richard Nixon arrived in Chinatown in San Francisco to give a speech during the 1960 presidential campaign. And behind Nixon is this huge banner in uh, Chinese. Now, <clears throat> Nixon nor his staff knew what it said, but it basically said, vote Kennedy. Uh, and Dick Tuck had put that there. Uh, Dick Tuck uh, would, a, a motorcade may be moving through a city, uh, let's just say Kansas City, Missouri, and Dick Tuck would uh, give a, a police officer uh, $100 or whatever. He says, when the motorcade comes your, up to your intersection, instead of sending them to the 
to the right, making a right-hand turn like they're supposed to do, why will you just signal for them to go left? And sure enough, the motorcade would come. The officer appreciated receiving $100 and we sent the motorcade the opposite direction to which the rally was that the pres uh, the candidate was expected. I mean, those were what were Dick Tuck type practical jokes. Yeah. Were they illegal? No. Were they commonplace? Yes. And that that is why, uh, and it's an important thing, I knew who Dick Tuck was. I knew the kinds of thick of things that Dick Tuck did. And he had every campaign that I had been in Starting in 1962, all the way through till 1968, there always had been Dick Tuck type stuff. Mm -hmm. There was the Dick Tuck type stuff in 1968. So, so what happened was that in February of 1971, uh, the, my buzzer went off, and I went into the Oval Office, and Bob Haldeman was sitting there with President Nixon, and. I don't know what they had been talking about before I got in there or whatever, but obviously <clears throat> the campaign subject must have been on the table mm -hmm. because they said, Dwight, do you know anybody that we could get that could do Dick Tuck type stuff in the seven, uh, the upcoming campaign? And I said, no, let me, let me think about it. Uh, and they said, fine or whatever. I mean, this I was in the office maybe – Two minutes, two and a half, yeah. three minutes. It was not some long meeting. They were asking me if I knew anybody that did Dick Tuck type stuff. I left the office. Uh, I went back to my office. I don't know. I, I can't tell you when I acted on it, mm -hmm. but it had to have been fairly quickly, probably within the week. And I talked to... Uh, uh, Gordon Strawn, who was a, another White House staffer that I had known that had been at USC. And I said, Don Segretti, Don Segretti, who had been a roommate of mine at, at USC, was about ready to leave uh, the military. He, he was a lawyer, a trained lawyer, had gone to Bolt out at Berkeley. Uh, he, he was kind of a non-assuming type guy. I mean, it was not... He, uh, it, it, there was no way that he was in a, like in a crowd. He, he, he wasn't six foot tall and you knew, yeah. knew instantly who he was. So I, I asked Gordon, I said, well, do you think Don would be good to be a Dick Tuck type guy? And uh, I didn't even have to explain to Gordon who Dick Tuck was. Yeah. That's, that's how well known Dick Tuck <clears throat> was. And, and Gordon said, that's probably a good idea. So I got in touch with Don and then Gordon took it over and arranged for him to be paid. And he came aboard, not at the White House. He never, to my knowledge, never was at the White House. Mm -hmm. But he became part of uh, our Dick Tuck activities. Uh, and that was the mistake that I made, is that I hired or arranged for the hiring of Don Segretti to do Dick, Dick Tuck activity. And I gave him some very limited direction. Uh, and so when Watergate came along and they started doing investigations, they found in Howard Hunt, who was one of the principal Watergate figures, in his address book was the name Don Segretti and a mm -hmm. phone number. Uh, that that it's ra a rather complicated story mm -hmm. as to how it ended up in the, his Don's name ended up in that phone book, uh, but it did, and that's what led to uh, Carl Bernstein at the Washington Post uh, going to California and try and brought Don Segretti into the whole uh, Greater Watergate thing, but Don's activities were basically limited to Dick Tuck type stuff. Mm -hmm. Don had nothing to do with the greater Watergate break-in and the uh, the main stuff that was investigated by the Watergate grand jury. And on this note, I think it's important for people to know, and I, I'm going to ask you 
<clears throat> because the, again, this is where you're talking about Don Segretti kind of gets conflated into being a, and you get wrapped up into this being conflated in being a direct participant with the Watergate break-ins and so on and so forth and through the press and so on and so forth, where the connection between Don Segretti and the Watergate break-ins, it seems like it was, it was nebulous. It wasn't really there. And the other thing I, I, I also understand Dick Tuck, um, did this from campaign to campaign to campaign to campaign. And there was never really any, I don't think he ever went to jail. I don't think he was ever fined. He was never arrested. It was sort of this kind of, you know, it's, it's what happens, practical jokes, not, not necessarily, you know, break-ins and wiretappings and so on, but practical jokes were sort of seen as, and even the whole notion of, you know, these kind of were more benign, dirty tricks and so on. My understanding was they were sort of, it was par for the course is what campaigns sort of did to each other. And, and it was funny. It was annoying. It was irritating, but it wasn't necessarily illegal. And my understanding was the Watergate break-in that was illegal. The wiretapping the the burglary, it was illegal. The Don Segretti stuff was more practical jokes and, and, and kind of a, a Dick Tuck, give or take kind of chess game, so to speak. Is that, is that fair to say? Yes, it's, it's fair to say, and it's incredibly important that when the story broke on Don Segretti in the Washington Post, uh, the headline and, and the upper part of the story talked about sabotage, espionage, uh, all, all of these words. Uh, and in fact, in I, I believe it's in All the President's Men, uh, both Woodward and Bernstein talk about the fact that their editor uh, hyped uh, the, the, the Segretti type activities in order to create more of a, uh, a fire under the whole uh, activities that, that Don did. But here, because here's what it was happening, Todd. What was happening is that through the boat, what they wanted to do, and they did very successfully, was connect Don Segretti to me. Yeah. And then I had never been as close to the president as I became the minute the Washington Post uh, attached Don mm -hmm. Segretti to me. And so now we have Dwight Chapin, presidential appointment secretary, uh, key aide, advisor, you know, uh, a person that the president couldn't live without type person, you know, closest to Haldeman. I mean, they, they, they used me as that leverage to help break into and make the tie-in to the White House and the greater Watergate thing, even though Segretti had nothing to do with the, the break-in and with all of that, they used Don and me in order to create this, this happening. And, and so therefore, our Dick Tuck stuff just disappeared into the wild blue yonder. And what became important was that, that we were saboteurs, that, that we had, had committed these crimes, that we were despicable, and you know the the media just drove that. They drove that narrative, and you know, so so that's that's what happened, and that's that's why uh, it became so important that they get me involved. Now, now the day before I was indicted, uh, indicted by the a grand jury, my lawyer called me and said, Dwight, the 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 prosecutors are willing to go very light on you uh, if you'll cooperate and be a witness against Haldeman and the president on uh, what you know. And I said, tell them to, uh, you know, no, no, yeah. I don't know anything. If I knew something, they'd be calling me to a grand jury. I don't yeah. know anything. But they would not believe that, and they indicted me the next day. And then I was the first person that went to trial. Uh, and I fought that all the way. You, you hear the expression of I'll, I'll fight it to the Supreme Court. I did. Yeah. I, I actually, I, I, I had br a brief written and so forth. Now the Supreme Court refused to hear my, my case, uh, but we thought we had a good case. Um, but then he, uh, but uh, I was, I was a pawn in this when, well, there was a wonderful man by the name of Eddie Carlson. He was the chairman of the board of United Airlines, where I had gone when I was forced to leave the White House. And Eddie call, ca called me into his office one day and said, Dwight, you know, do you, do you realize what's going on? I said, yes, sir. He said, you know, you are a political football. 
Mm-hmm. He said, you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. <clears throat> so the, the wrong place at the wrong time was working for the president of the United States. And by the way, all this happened when we were getting ready to go to China, most of what I'm describing. But I, I've got to tell you, Todd, in my looking at it now, and as you clearly know from reading my book, I don't look at it that I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I do look at it that mistakes were made and that if I could change what I what I did, I wouldn't hire Don Segretti to be yeah. our Dick Tuck. No question that that was wrong. But but what I gained, what the experiences I had, you know, uh, the, these were life-changing, life-altering things and, and moments in history that are priceless. And so I wouldn't change any of it. You know, and just for our listeners who aren't as as familiar with, with some of the Watergate narrative, my understanding is I've read your book and I've read countless books on Watergate and so on, um, is that, again, there was you and Don Segretti, who was, by the way, a lawyer who I think in, at one point you said, I hired you in part because you know what's right and what's wrong from a legal standpoint. So there was a recognition that Don also had a judgment about not crossing the line with respect to practical jokes and so on. But when it came to Watergate, Watergate was kind of, if I'm not mistaken, the whole breaking into the Watergate complex, where, which is the headquarters for the DNC. Um, this was, uh, you know, if it was, if I'm not mistaken, John Dean and Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy and several ex-former uh, CIA, um, I don't know if it was Cuban exiles or what have you, who were involved. Chuck Colson, I think, had somewhat of a hand, if I'm not mistaken. But the bottom line is there were, there were almost parallel tracks where the Watergate side was like part of the plumbers op- White House plumbers operation, and here you are over on this side as you know your your Dwight Chapin, your your a special assistant to the president, and you're working with Don Segretti, who's kind of doing his own thing, kind of under the auspices of having a good legal mind about what's right and wrong. And he's out of your he's sort of out of your orbit. You're, you've got you're planning the China trip. You're working day in and day on other things. Is that fair? I'm not trying to overly silo the Watergate side and the White House plumbers and and the illegalities over here. And and here you are with Don Segretti, and then you're just trying to do your own job. But it seems that your line was more of kind of answering the Dick Tuck stuff and never crossing over into the real Ill- illegalities that came along with the White House plumbers work. Is that fair to say? That's fair. <clears throat> and and the, pr- the proof is that I was never even, I never was called to the main Watergate grand jury. Mm. I, 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 there was a separate grand jury that dealt with what they call dirty tricks, which yeah. is where they put the Dick Tuck and the Segretti stuff. And that's, that's, that's the grand jury I dealt with. But the principal, gra- the, the main arena was the, uh, ba- the, the main part was the cover up of, of Watergate and the whiteout activities that were related to the cover-up. It's important to underscore that that Richard Nixon, when he as he made his decisions and as Bob Haldeman had to to deal with it, that for nine months, for nine months, John Dean lied to Nixon and to Haldeman and to Ehrlichman. He never, ever talked about his complicity in this, nor did Gordon Strawn, the guy that I mentioned earlier, who also knew there were only two people at the White House that knew about the break-in ahead of time. And a court, and this, this was told uh, to John Dean by Gordon Liddy. Gordon Liddy was the security guy at the committee. The two people that knew... John Dean and Gordon Strawn, had they come forward uh, immediately upon this happening and said uh, to, to either Haldeman or the president or John Ehrlichman or what, Here, here's what happened, here's what we know, we, we would have never had a Watergate. I mean, it would, just would not have happened. Nixon was operating for nine months in, in, in a vacuum. Uh, so the, there, the other thing, point that's uh, worth noting, and you mentioned the CIA, there, believe it or not, there is work underway right now in 2023 where they are trying to connect the dots as to exactly what the CIA's involvement was. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we, if we haven't learned anything else through the 
whole Trump episodes and and the Biden and the uh, the various scandal type stuff that's going on right now, we 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 know that there is there is uh, something. Label it however you want, but if you want to use the word deep state, use that. That that when you that these dots need to be connected, and that that was an issue back in the Nixon years. There were plenty of people that wanted Richard Nixon out of office. They did not want him succeeding. And one of the biggest factors in the whole thing was the former Jack Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Ted Kennedy organization. 23 of the lawyers on the prosecutorial side came out of Harvard or were related to work done by Bobby Kennedy in the Justice Department or or helped on committees that were where Ted uh, Kennedy was the chair they, they, they need after Chappaquiddick they needed to figure out how they were going to bring Ted Kennedy back into the limelight and get him back in on a presidential track and this was all tied in to this Nixon's resignation and the Watergate episodes you know one of the <clears throat> One of the things I think we I want to also very much clarify that that the 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 Watergate break in the wiretapping were illegal acts and so they they were it was a, those were criminal acts they shouldn't have been done there had to be a prosecutions for them I think of note what we have to say is when we look at this episode of of the analysis of Nixon and the prosecution of of what uh, of what how things kind of un, you know happened it's just it's important to say the the Dick Tuck practical jokes and dirty tricks was something that was happening on the other side of the of the uh, the political ledger and was never seen to be punishable, illegal. It was bothersome, but it was allowed. It was allowed. It was never, I mean, this is a guy that my understanding is, I, I would listen to some of his interviews and it was sort of kind of tongue in cheek and everybody kind of laughed about it and so on and so forth. The other thing I think the two of note is in Project Mockingbird, President Kennedy wiretapped, uh, I think, two New York Times reporters. Um, Johnson used the FBI digging Goldwater, a uh, dirt on Goldwater campaign staffers and to spy on the Nixon campaign. FDR uh, gave the FBI carte blanche to wiretap those who they deem subversive. People sometimes think Nixon, the Nixon administration, what happened there with Watergate was this standalone example of corruption that's unparalleled in history and it was a, a long national nightmare and so on. But if one, and this is where I look at like Woodward and Bernstein and say, the true intrepid reporter would be saying, let's look at other administrations as what has been kind of common practice. Now that doesn't mean it isn't illegal, but one should call out the illegalities in in any administrations where it was it was done if if dirty tricks were not illegal but they were bothersome and, and and problematic but they were carried out in other administrations well then the Woodward and Bernsteins need to say we thought those dirty tricks were fine and therefore we're not going to basically call out the, the the practical jokes and dirty tricks of the Nixon administration so it's a very interesting thing about this this is where part of our conversation I was I was so eager for because um the, the narrative surrounding Watergate is the notion of there's black hats and there's white hats, right? The bad guys are the black hats committing crimes deemed threatening to our, our democracy within the Nixon administration. And the white hats in this narrative are the crusading press, most notably Woodward and Bernstein, a few from the New York Times, and the fact-finding Senate Watergate committee. And the question is, is it that simple? And, and, and that's not to, to, to excuse the wrongdoings that that there were within the Nixon administration, as you, ju as you basically just said. Uh, it's not to excuse the wrongdoings in the Nixon administration, because we know that Nixon wanted to achieve and secure power, but also Ben Bradley wanted to win Pulitzer Prizes. Woodward and Bernstein wanted to write gripping stories. They even illegally uh, questioned impaneled grand jurists with the intent to release protected information, which is a federal crime. And there were senators that were interested in opportunistically putting their party back into the president's seat. So the question I, I with this long diatribe, and forgive me, but the question with this is in the, this morass of agendas, Across the across everybody involved in the Watergate narrative within the administration, but in the press and the Congress, et cetera, are there truly black hats and white hats, or is the truth more complicated than that? <clears throat> well, from my point of view, there are black hats and white hats. Uh, and your analysis is fantastic because you were so right on. Uh, I mean, I could take various pieces of it. What, what, one, uh, 
one denominator is that the media, particularly particularly the Washington Post, New York Times, CBS, so, so forth, never made as much money as they did during Watergate. Now, that that may have changed when Trump came along, because if you take what, and look at what Trump did for ratings for MSNBC, Fox, uh, CNN, uh, you know, Trump disappears. They've got to figure out how to get Trump back on because the ratings go up. They got mm. Watergate sold newspapers, sold yeah. magazines, Time, Newsweek, the U.S. News, World Report, everything. It was an economic driver. Okay. So there's there's no question about that. We, the, Jeff Shepard has written a book called the Watergate, cons, the Nixon conspiracy, the Nixon conspiracy, and he has the he is the only person that has gone back and gone through the files of the Watergate special prosecutors, and he has found that there was. Uh, a coordinated effort, a, a conspiracy, if you want to really take it to the right place, between Judge Sirica, the prosecutors, and the Senate Watergate Committee. Mm-hmm. And they they orchestrated uh, a lot of the release of documents, a lot of the information that was provided to the public through the media was done in a way to get Nixon. And that information that they had was not provided to the defense, meaning the people defending Nixon, or when the trials came forward, the people defending Haldeman, Mitchell, and Ehrlichman, and Colson, and so forth. So there, there, I, I know for a fact that there is a documentary in production right now that's going to air uh, around... July and August of next year, which is the 50th anniversary of Nixon's resignation. Uh, And this documentary is backed up by very sophisticated legal minds like Mm. uh, former Solicitor General Ted Olson, uh, uh, Justice, uh, I forget his name right now, uh, District Judge in Washington, D.C., Alan Dershowitz, Mm -hmm has looked at this material and, and acknowledged it to be be correct and factual. Uh, they have actual documents from the files of the prosecutors that document that they coordinated with Judge Sirica, and they met with him in private secretly as they put all this together. So yeah, your point is very well taken. That, that Black hat, you know, the the public was led to believe that we have this evil Nixon, and and the Nixon men, and that 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 they're all corrupt. That this is the worst thing. That they tried to steal our democracy from us. I mean, it, 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 they really laid it on there, and it's just not true. Uh, and it's going to take a lot of historians, years to untangle all this. Do you know that the files that are, or the, the, what the tapes that we are so knowledgeable about that kind of define the Nixon presidency are the abuse of power tapes. And they only represent about three to 4% of the actual tapes that exist on the Nixon presidency. So uh, many of us that are uh, concerned about the Nixon legacy and want it pu- and want it put into the into an accurate historical framework. Now we're not asking for any whitewash here. No, but yeah. I mean it's got to be warts and all. But but we're looking forward to when these this huge portion of the tapes that have not even been de- transcribed are reviewed, and what it tells us about how Nixon ran our government. Because what what I witnessed and, and, and so forth can't not be, you cannot define him by Watergate. You have got to define this man 
by the entirety of his whole career. And that is exactly what Bill Clinton said at the, in his eulogy, that, the, that Richard Nixon needed to be defined by the entirety of his life and public service. Dwight, in this book, which I commend people to read your book, um, again, The President's Man, a, a, a memoir of someone very up close and personal to President Nixon and his administration. So much of your book is about uh, your experience with Nixon and Nixon's presidency. Um, clearly, you get into Watergate, your own kind of the legal morass you kind of found yourself in, ultimately serving time for nine months for what was described as false statements. Um, the, the long and the short is it, it's a it's a real it's a real unfolding of of what it's like um, in the pres the Nixon presidency, his accomplishments, his style, warts, but also his his virtues and so on. I want to ask you, Soviet dissident um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn once wrote, the line separating good and evil passes not through states nor between classes nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart. And I want to ask you, what, Dwight, have you learned about human nature in this experience? And, and from the presidency to his staff, from the press to the Congress, what have you learned about human objectivity, about fairness, and about self-deception? Well, uh, I, you you made the point in an off um, off the air comment about Doctor Peel and the power of positive thinking, mm. and. I was my grandmother gave me Dr. Peel's book on my ninth birthday. It was that was the year that it was published. Norman Vincent and, Peel, for those those people who don't know who Dr. Peel is, Norman Vincent Peel. Yeah, and he wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking, and I I believe in that. I, I believe uh, there was a man by the name of W. Clement Stone who was one of Dr. Peel's closest friends. Yeah. And he, he, I published a magazine for him called Success Magazine. Uh, and we had to subtitle the magazine with a positive mental attitude. And, and Mr. Stone made the point to me one day, he said, Dwight, understand that having a positive mental attitude doesn't mean going around going whoopee. It means having the right attitude in a given situation. And I, I've always tried to have a positive mental attitude. Yeah. I I have found myself becoming cynical. Uh, most most recently, and it but it ties right back to what you're talking of the the ability of the media to really tell the truth. Uh, I I believe that a media person, be they a Democrat or a Republican, has, has an obligation to practice some discipline and put that over to the side and to take and go out and dig and find out what the truth is on things. Mm -hmm. Now, it's harder on Watergate than it is on some of the current stuff. Uh, but but um, because on Watergate, we had a, a liar right at the core, and that was John Dean and Gordon Strott. The, 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 the lies were being told to the president. So the president is reacting to something in a way, not having full information. Did Nixon make some mistakes? Yes. I'm not, I'm not trying to erase the mistakes, but I'm, but, but. The investigative side of it uh, had had a lot of pre prejudging in it by the the Woodward and the Bernstein's and as you point out the uh, Bradley and the Post and the fact that 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 they really didn't give a damn what the truth was if they could keep the ball moving. So, uh, but there's a combination in there that makes it less clear than several of the situations that we're dealing with now uh, <clears throat> in terms of the clarity and the, the media's ability to decipher this and then bring it forward to the, to the press. The, 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 the media has become, they've become advocates, not reporters. They, they, there's a, a shift in the discipline of the 
professionalism of the the art of reporting. I don't know that we'll ever get it back. Um, we it was most blatantly uh, put forward to us the other day on that when the Hamas. Uh, missile uh, uh, <coughs> rocket itself destroyed the hospital and not the Israelis, and and everybody is off running with the story that the Israelis had 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 taken out that hospital. I mean, it, it's just like you know nobody's taking the the kind of deep breath and doing, you know, okay, what? Let's get to the truth on this. I mean, and and it's 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 also kind of a sad commentary on the the world that we're living in right now. It, it's the new social media world where where truth mixes with fiction and you can take it any num- number of different ways. And now we have artificial intelligence coming into it and they're, they're working from the sources to create the, quote, accuracy, but they're using false information, perhaps. So it's it's an incredibly complicated question, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. Let me ask you this, Dwight, as we wind down our time. Um, gosh, I could spend hours talking and asking questions. I hope we can do this again. The, the, the president and most of your colleagues, because you were such a young man when you started, most of them have passed away. And I want to ask you, if you had the opportunity to meet any of them, whether it's Nixon, Haldeman. I know Kissinger, is, Kissinger I know, is still alive, and you connect with him. Um, Ehrlichman. Are there any pressing questions you would like to ask them if you had the opportunity? Oh, wow. Um, I, I would in, love nothing more than to be able to sit with uh, Bob and, jo- and John, John, but both Johns, John Mitchell and John Ehrlichman, mm. uh, and, and talk, talk this through uh, and, and get their their perspective. Both Haldeman and Mitchell said in their in their uh, last words, if you will, uh, they left us with the thought that we do not yet know all the facts on Watergate. That there's more to it than than we know. And of course, I would like to know what that is. Uh, I do believe that a lot of it ties to the CIA stuff. That we're that's that's coming forward, uh, so that would be one thing. The other thing I would like to know much more about is General Alexander Haig, because I know that Haig, and I did not know this until I started working on my book, that Haig uh, was one of the people responsible for the establishment of a spy ring in the White House that spied on Henry Kissinger and on President Nixon to get information back to the Pentagon. This is important because General Haig, could, he couldn't do it himself because Hall, uh, Ehrlich, uh, not, um, Nixon or Kissinger would have fired him if, if, because Haig was reporting to, to Kissinger. So he had to set up a mechanism to get this information back to the Pentagon. And that undermined uh, what Henry and Nixon were trying to do. And I, I, I harbor a suspicion that General Haig always wanted to be president of the United States. I know that he came to Chicago when I was working for W. Clement Stone, and we had a fundraising luncheon uh, to raise money for his campaign for the presidency. This is after he had served as Secretary of State under Reagan. So Al, Al made it all the way to Secretary of State, and, and he really wanted to be president. And I think he had these aspirations back when he was working at the White House. And therefore, it affected how he dealt with certain issues. The single most important issue that Al dealt with was after Haldeman left, Al Haig became Nixon's chief of staff. And if Al Haig was harboring suspe- uh, aspirations to be president, he wanted to be certain that none of his involvement in the spy ring became known to the public. Had Nixon gone with impeachment instead of resignation, 
what Haig did would become public knowledge mm-hmm. because the House would have investigated that. Mm-hmm. So that's a very uh, important little issue that it would be fabulous to know what the truth is on that. It is not inconsequential that Nixon resigned and that two nights later there was an embassy party in Washington that the Hagues went to. And they went home at around 11.15 and the doorbell rang at 11.20. And at 11.20, Woodward and Bernstein walked into Hague's home and stayed for a couple of hours as Al Haig briefed them for their book that they wrote on Nixon's final days. Uh, and that information basically underscored how Al, how Al Haig, General Haig, had saved America from Richard Nixon. Why did Al do that? How did it tie into his plan to become president of the United States someday? I mean, <laughs> there was a lot going on, Todd, that, that I, I sure as heck didn't know back then. And as an uh, a senior citizen now and someone that kind of tries to study this day in and day out and figure out what the truth is, uh, it, 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 it leads you to believe, boy, there's a lot going on that we never know anything about. Uh, maybe that's good and maybe that's bad, but uh, I, 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 I tend to think, you know, the most important thing is to get the light of truth on all of this yeah. and let the chips fall where the chips fall. And that is true of scandals today that we're dealing with and true of scandals from the past. I believe Richard Nixon was really uh, a victim of some real uh, manipulation and determined people that wanted to bring him down and they won and he lost. I, it sounds like in your in some of your remarks here, I can almost sense another book coming out here. And I, <laughs> I would be, I know it's a lot of work, but I'd be excited to bring you on for that. <laughs> two, two, two last questions for you, Dwight. <clears throat> why did you write this memoir now? 50 years after the events. Why, why now? Why not 10 or 15 years after it kind of settled? You know, you again, you and I, I want to commend people to go and read your book, The President's Man, in part also about the nine months, the the, pro, the legal process you went through, the nine months you had to send you to spend in a minimum security prison, how you were formed and shaped by that, the impact on faith and so on. I wanted to ask you, though, why 50 years later is this book coming out now? Well, uh, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. Uh, There's a couple of quick answers to that. Number one, I was in Kansas City visiting uh, one of my daughters and one of my little grandson, he was seven at the time, knocked on the door and said, Pips, they call me Pips. Uh, My grandchildren do. And he said, Pips, he said, did you work for a president? And I said, yes, Matthew, I did. he said, and he, he kind of had this look on his face, he says, but but you went to prison. Did the president go to prison too? And I said, Matthew, come on in, sit on the bed here, let me, and I said, you're pretty tiny right now, and as you get older, I'll be happy to explain it all to you. So always feel free to ask me a question. And I said to my wife, you know, Matthew just didn't come up with this. This must have been discussion going on within the family or whatever. Yeah, I yeah. need to get I need to get my story down so that my children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren know what the hell happened with me. That was yeah. that's one part of it. The other part of it is that I was I wrote I was writing a novel. I wrote a novel uh, about and the, the two characters in the novel are Howard Hughes and Richard Nixon. And so I, I figured these are two of the most eccentric men uh, that have ever been dealt with in the media. I'll do a book, book on this. And I was having a, a uh, drink with uh, James Rosen, who at the time was a re- correspondent at Fox in, in Washington. And we were chatting. And I was telling him about my novel. He said, Dwight, why in the world? Are you writing a novel? He said, you live some of the greatest history that's ever been. Why don't, why aren't you writing a book? Uh, So those two things kind of, those two things motivated me. 
The good news is I waited 50 years. Yeah. Most people that work in the White House write a book 10 minutes after they've walked yeah. out the door, yeah. and they have motives that are questionable, in my opinion. I think that my waiting 50 years and doing this gave me time to digest what happened to me, uh, gave me time to reflect on all these different individuals that I talk about in my book, to think about the issues, think about Nixon the man. Uh, it gave me a whole different perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I'm happy I waited. Uh, I was asked as recently as yesterday why I, uh, ab about was I, am I satisfied with the outcome of the book? And the, the person asking me was talking mainly about sales. Mm. And I said, you know, I, I don't know how many it sold. My guess is 15,000 or something like that. It's some, but, but it's not a big, big bestseller. But it's not gonna, that's not the important thing. It, 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 it's my reflection mm. of a historical period in time the people I knew, what I know about what I did and I didn't, what I did and didn't do, and it's now part of the official record. It's there for historians. It's there for amateur historians. It's there for whoever wants to dig into it, and it will always be there. And uh, one of my great friends who's now deceased, Bruce Hershenson, who, by the way, dealt personally with Alexander Solzhenitsyn when he, he was living up in New Hampshire. Wow. Bruce called me right not shortly before he died. He said, Dwight, I had just sent him chapter one. That's all he, the only chapter he ever read. And he said, Dwight, this book is going to be in the Library of Congress. It's going to be available through history, and you've done a great thing by getting, it, getting your uh, record down there so that it could be read by others. And so I, I feel very good that, that I was able to get this accomplished. Uh, why now? Uh, I'm 83. Mm -hmm. So uh, God willing, I mean, I love the song, Young at Heart, mm -hmm. and you'll survive to 105 if all you do <laughs> is keep me alive. So I'm shooting for 105, but I'm not sure if I'm going to make it uh, that far. <laughs> but, but I thought it was better to get it done now rather than tempt fate and, and not have it done at all. Well, I'll tell you that a lot of historians have said, and you can see on the, the inscriptions on the book, Kissinger and Douglas Brinkley and others are saying this changes, this, this will bend Nixon's scholarship with this new firsthand information to reassess, to reconsider, to rethink, um, because this isn't a second, third, fourth hand you know, kind of revisionist kind of a perspective. It, it is a person who was at the heart of a lot of things, uh, it, all, of all things, Nixon for some of the most, some of the most pivotal times in his life. So, and it's a, it's, it's a really even keeled, thoughtful, well-written and gripping work um, that I think most people that would, uh, that are really not familiar with, with, with the Watergate or the Nixon presidency and so on. I would just commend them to read. I also mentioned that we've had James Rosen on, on the podcast about his Scalia book. He also um, wrote the the book, obviously on on, on uh, 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 Attorney General uh, Mitchell as great, well. Great, yeah, great yeah. book. I want I want to finish with one last question. I want to thank you for being so generous with your time here, Dwight. Near the end of your book, you cite one of President Nixon's uh, favored quotes from Sophocles, who I think he heard from uh, President Charles de Gaulle. <clears throat> one must wait until the evening to see how splendid the day has been. So Dwight, given your life soaring heights and your difficult descents, um, when you reflect now upon the evening of your life, has the day been splendid? Oh, the day has been magnificent. <laughs> uh, I mean, how gifted can a person be? Uh, uh, I'm blessed with great family, people that love me, uh, wonderful, wonderful friends. Uh, I, I've been able to put this story out. I've been able to uh, live what's in that book. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, not many people have the President of the United States introduce them to the Pope. Uh, I mean, just extraordinary, extraordinary type things that I was 
gifted in my life, and they're precious. And uh, and I, 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 I live my life every day with a high, high degree of gratitude. Um, I, I, I know how lucky I've been. And as I said, my dad says you make your own luck. Well, I may have made some of my own luck, but I also had a string of really lucky opportunities. Dwight Chapin, lucky and good. Special (laughs) assistant to the president and author of The President's Man. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you, Todd. So I've been thinking, it's not very often you get the chance to speak with a personal aide and then deputy assistant to the president of the United States, especially when that president happens to be Richard Nixon. Even more, it's not often you have the opportunity to chat with someone who logistically organized one of the seminal events in 20th century foreign policy history, that is, Nixon's historic trip to China, which opened the juggernaut communist nation to the world. Finally, it is not often that you get to meet someone whose name passed the lips of Dustin Hoffman as Carl Bernstein in Alan Pakula's iconic film, All the President's Men, and someone who served several months in prison convicted of two charges of false statements surrounding not the Watergate break-in, but the association with campaign dirty tricks through a friend named Donald Segretti. Now, that's a lot of not very often's. And just what did I learn? Well. It's complicated. People are complicated. Heck, we're all complicated. Now, lest anyone misunderstands, I want to be clear, breaking into the Watergate building, the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee, and setting up wiretaps was illegal, period. This reflection draws no conclusion otherwise. And to be clear, Dwight Chapin had nothing to do with the Watergate break-ins. His conviction was about something else. Instead, for a moment, I would like to consider the messiness of what it means to be human. Luke Nichter, as Dwight Chapin tells us in The President's Man, is perhaps the foremost historian of the Nixon White House tapes, that is, those tapes Nixon secretly recorded over three years, ostensibly for his memoirs. Nichter observed that between 5 to 7% of those tapes had relevance to Nixon's abuse of power. Those are the tapes that have been widely released and publicized. They, in fact, are all the public really knows. And yet the other 93 to 95% of the tapes reveal the daily operations and nuances, thoughts and considerations, successes and failures of the president and his staff in the highest office of the land. Now, that doesn't excuse the 5 to 7% that involve abuse of power. It just means that there was a lot more to the Nixon presidency than his crimes. On a number of things, Nixon was wrong, but he was complicated. Chapin tells a story about Nixon meeting with Hubert Humphrey. After defeating the Democratic nominee in the 1968 election, Nixon's planned 10-minute meeting with Humphrey stretched beyond 30 minutes. When Chapin walked into the room to steer the president back on schedule, he found Nixon consoling Humphrey, warmly embracing him as tears streamed down Humphrey's face. Now, reading this, I was moved, as was Chapin, by this show of genuine affection by Nixon, a man reputed to be a cold fish. After Humphrey left, Nixon locked Chapin with a gaze, saying, Dwight, believe me, that is so, so hard. I remember. And then only a few seconds later, Nixon added, but I didn't cry. In that moment, Nixon simultaneously cared for Humphrey and yet couldn't help adding that barb. Shortly after the death of Martin Luther King Jr., Nixon insisted on visiting Coretta Scott King and King's parents at their homes in Atlanta. In doing this, Nixon insisted on no press alert and no cameras, simply seeking only a connection, a simple, unpublicized human engagement with a grieving family. Chapin and his colleagues were moved by this decidedly apolitical gesture. Later that evening, however, having flown to Florida, Nixon turned to Chapin and wondered, how's our trip to Atlanta playing? Befuddled, Chapin answered that, as requested, they had successfully achieved a media blackout. Nixon, with darkening eyes and a shaking head, muttered, if nobody knows, we're going to have to go to the funeral. In that moment, Nixon simultaneously grieved for the King family and yet couldn't turn off his political radar. 
At the same time, Chapin also relayed stories of Nixon's love for his wife, affection for his daughters, and devotion to his staff. His work ethic, according to Chapin, was unparalleled, and his commitment to learn from historically great figures was obsessive. He was proud of his country, but earnestly wanted to untangle the raveled mess that comes with governing. To better understand Richard Nixon, one might borrow from, borrow from Samuel Johnson's observations of Shakespeare's complicated characters. Quote, Nixon is a mine which contains gold and diamonds in, in unexhaustible plenty, though clouded by incrustations, debased by impurities, and mingled with a mass of meaner minerals. Close quote. Nixon's story is one of virtue mixed with vice, wholeness marred by brokenness. It is complicated and messy. To truly understand him, one searches but never arrives. It is the enigma of the human condition. After years of suffering and languishing in the Soviet gulags, Alexander Solzhenitsyn made this observation. Gradually, it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. This line shifts. Inside us, it oscillates with the years, and even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehead of good is retained. And even in the best of all hearts, there remains an unuprooted small corner of evil. So too with Nixon. In fact, so too with us all. And one last thing. To have a good and honest look at the many facets of Richard Nixon, watch Alan Pakula's film, All the President's Men a riveting portrayal of intrepid reporting surrounding the Watergate break-in. Notwithstanding its slant, it is the movie that made Woodward and Bernstein household names. But to be fair, read Dwight Chapin's The President's Man for an honest insider's look at the person of Nixon, good, bad, and ugly, the operations of the Nixon White House, and an engaging story of a young assistant's rise and fall and rise again. In the end, I believe you will come to a similar conclusion that I did. Human nature is complicated dignified, fallible, but redeemable with a God who never leaves our corner. Thank you once again for joining me on the Evangelization and Culture Podcast. I'm Todd Warner, and until we meet again, keep bringing Christ to a hungry culture.